Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. Today we're going to explore the account of the events of the first Easter morning as detailed in Matthew's Gospel. But before we dive into that, if you've not done so already, you may find it helpful to download the sheet accompanying this study, the link for which is available in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. So then, without further ado, let us dive into today's passage, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. We've just had the events of Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus, and we're told that after he had died, Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Pharisees, and described as a disciple of Jesus, a follower and adherent, uh, gets the body and he places it in a newly hewn tomb, a tomb that he'd originally intended for himself. As the Sabbath day was approaching, a pair of women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem watched this and it seems determined to go back when the Sabbath had ended. We hear all about that in verses 57 to 61 of chapter 27. Now the normal practice at that time was that a body would initially be laid to rest in a tomb for about a year and then after that it was normal for the remains to be then removed from the tomb taken to a burial ground which would be their final resting place. And the act of anointing that would often happen was about both showing respect to the person who had died and preserving their body, countering the stench of decay with the pleasant smelling herbs. It's likely that although Matthew doesn't explicitly tell us that that's what the two women intended to do, that that's probably why they returned to the tomb. That kind of work was not permitted on the Sabbath day itself. So all of that sets the scene for today's reading. Now we have a fair few characters involved in today's scene. So first up we have two Marys. We have Mary Magdalene and then we have Mary the mother of James and Joseph. Now we know that they were the first witnesses to the resurrection which is significant because at that time women were not permitted to give testimony in court. So the fact that women were the first witnesses and that's recorded I think points to the authenticity of the accounts that we have. We should also note that this second Mary, sometimes referred to as the other Mary, Mary of mother of James and Joseph, was quite probably also the mother of Jesus. If we look at chapter 13, verse 55, we see Mary, Jesus's mother, described as also being the mother of James and Joseph. And it seems that by using this identification, Matthew wants to make clear that it's her discipleship that matters rather than her birth relation to Jesus which is an interesting uh, way of thinking about it. We have the mysterious figure of the angel of the Lord, whose dazzling white clothes might remind us of Jesus's transfiguration, and I'll come back to that later. And it's this mysterious figure who was frightening, who was not the kind of uh, lovely fluffy angel on a cloud eating Philadelphia <laughs> that is sometimes pictured, uh, who lets the women know that Jesus is indeed risen. We've also got the guards, the soldiers who had been placed to guard the tomb by the chief priests and the Pharisees, as we learned about in chapter 27 verses 62 to 66. They were frightened that Jesus's disciples were going to steal the body and then falsely claim he'd been raised from the dead. And finally we have that group of disciples including but not limited to the eleven who were left after the betrayal by Judas. And they'd stayed in the city of Jerusalem, it seems, despite having fled 
when Jesus was arrested. We learn in other Gospels that they were hiding in an upper room. Now Matthew's was the second of the four canonical Gospels to be written, likely around 75 to 80 of the Common Era. And it's the most overtly Jewish of the four Gospels, the most clearly grounded in Second Temple Judaism. And it follows on from the destruction of the Temple in the year 70, which is significant because it's a point at which we really see divergence between church and synagogue. And I think some of this narrative about the soldiers guarding the tomb and whatnot reflects the tensions that that brought about. It may be useful when you look at this text to compare it to the other three resurrection accounts that we have in the canonical Gospels. The earliest we have is Mark chapter 16 verses 1 to 8. Then we've got today's reading. Then we've got Luke 24 verses 1 to 12. And then finally, John chapter 20, verses 1 through to 18. Now, the empty tomb account, as I've already noted, is set after the Sabbath, early in the morning and on the first day of a new week. We learn in verse 1. And thus it's on the third day after Jesus' death, which is where that chronology comes in. The same two women who saw where Jesus had been laid returned to the tomb, we're told. And we know from verses 59 and 60 of chapter 27 that, as was usual, there was a large stone that had been rolled over the entrance to the tomb. Now, the Greek word that's used for see in verse 1, ferose, kind of means more than just kind of clocking it's about observation, it's about keeping vigil. So it implies that they were planning to stay there for a while, perhaps to pray. And I think also the suggestion of they would have anointed Jesus's body is um, a pertinent one. This was a dedicated watching. And it's in the midst of that, that their world and indeed all our worlds are turned upside down and inside out forever. It's really difficult to overstate the importance of the imagery that we find in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 28, in which, as Melinda Quivick puts it in her very helpful commentary, light splits a crack in our universe and everything we thought we knew is changed. The two Marys experience a sudden earthquake in the Greek seismos, in which the ground literally and metaphorically moved beneath them. And we might be reminded of the earthquake documented in chapter 27, verse 51, immediately after Jesus died. And as this all happens, we see we hear about a single angel, as opposed to the multiple figures in Mark's account, for example, rolling the stone away from the entrance to the tomb and then taking a seat on it, bizarrely, as we hear in verse 2. In verse 3, we're told that this messenger from God, this angel of the Lord, looked like lightning, and thus, as Quivick puts it, like a sizzling power fraught with danger. And this angel's clothing becoming dazzling white reminds us, as I've already hinted, of what happens to Jesus at his transfiguration when his clothes become dazzling white as he meets with Moses and Elijah. That's documented in chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. So it gives us that connection to another scene where we've uh, been told about the glory of God being revealed. And it's interesting that uh, the three disciples who were at the scene of the Transfiguration were not permitted to tell others about it until after the resurrection. So there's a kind of tying of things together going on in the description. Now, there are two major themes running throughout this whole passage. The first of those is the theme of fear, phobos, in the Greek. And it's present, for example, in verse 4, when we're told about the guards fainting with fear and trembling. It's in verse 5, when Jesus first tells the women not to be afraid. And in verse 10, when he says the same thing to the disciples. And it's also there, perhaps most interestingly of all, in verse 8 where we're told that the women went away from the tomb full of fear as well as great joy. 
Now, the second major theme in this passage is that of vision. And it's present, for example, with the angels speaking about the women coming to see Jesus. And, and the, the sense of the verb that's used there is seeking what was at hand, but is now lost. So there's that tinge of, of sadness there. It's also present this theme of, of vision in the invitation to look inside the tomb and see for themselves in verse six that was given to the women. And the two references to Jesus going ahead of the disciples and being seen in Galilee in verse seven and in verse 10. As Quivick very helpfully puts it, looking for and yearning, fearing and seeing are deeply intertwined in the presence of the holy. Now, as I say, the two women, the two Marys, were told by the angel of the Lord not to be afraid. Now, this isn't an instruction, a command, as much as a reassurance that there is fundamentally nothing to be afraid of on one level. It's, it's a comforting thing and they're invited in what follows in verse 6 to see for themselves that Jesus really is risen by looking into the empty tomb. And once they've done that, as verse 7 tells us, they're to carry the promise that Jesus will go ahead of the rest of the disciples to Galilee back to the eleven and the others who were waiting with them. Hence, at the core of this passage is a promise reiterated in verse 10, having been initially made in verse 7. And it basically it's a promise that the risen Jesus will meet the disciples where they go. And in verse 7, give, having been given this promise to share, the women are invited to re-enter back into their lives with joyful abandon. And we see in verse 8 that they do that as they rush back to tell the other disciples. Now those disciples were told run to the tomb to see for themselves in verse 9. And we here we have another notable difference with what we find in the other Gospels in that the writer does not single out Peter or John, the beloved disciple. It's just the disciples as a unit were told come. And they bow down in worship and interestingly they touch the feet of Jesus, those feet that we learn from other accounts of resurrection appearances still had the uh, marks of the nails in them where Jesus had been crucified. So it's almost like a kind of touch and be convinced uh, to, to, to go with the, the empty tomb, all pointing to the reality of resurrection and the thought that there is some physicality there, which is really important. We're talking about a physical bodily resurrection because Jesus's body can be touched. But also that we're not talking about seeing a ghost. We're talking about something real and tangible, albeit world changing and a point where heaven and earth uniquely connect. Finally, we note in verse 10 in the promise that's made that the Greek term that the NRSV and other Bibles translate as brothers could equally well be translated brothers and sisters. It's an example of where a masculine term has been taken to be all inclusive. So we might want to, to even say siblings. So there's an awful lot going on in this passage. It, it, it's a really an amazing passage to grapple with. And for me, in many ways, it's the most powerful of the four accounts we have of the resurrection because of that moment where there's the earthquake and the angel who looked like lightning. It, it really captures some of the amazing out of this worldness of that first Easter morning and holds together the reality that there is often fear in the sense of awe and wonder and trepidation perhaps and um, you know a, a recognition of one's place before the holy of holies alongside the great joy and it holds these things together. So with all that in mind, we now turn to the questions for this week. <laughs> 